can never count. You look at the damn thing. But he's the, the systems analysis guy going back in the 40s or whatever. It goes back to Weiner, uh, Ashby, and all the others. It's your own Najib Kayos. And he produced this work in Spanish in, on systems analysis. I cite it. Um, and I can give you the title afterwards and so forth. But if you want to know anything about systems analysis, the history, the philosophy, you name it, I don't care what it is about systems analysis, it is there. So I highly recommend that if you read Spanish. Hopefully we can get this thing translated. Frankly, I'd like to see that as a triple IS publication. But that is the work before even reading anything else. Anyway, that's an advertisement. I'm just super impressed with the thing. I'm still going through it. But but that's essentially what a system is. Inputs, outputs, boundaries. Boundaries, that's a lot of discussion on what kind of boundaries and how you circumscribe it. But that is the essence of it. Reasons for an origin of a system. From a point of view of logic, I teach logic. I used to teach it anyway. From a systems perspective. We have a collection of objects and rules and everything else and boundaries. You, in essence, have a system. Everything about us. I, I, can you relate anything with something else as a system? Ultimately, yes. I'll show you how this can be done. And it all is up here in the construct. You're the ones that set the limits. You're the ones that put together systems and see order and whatever it is. But let's go down and see what the origins of these. this is. All right. There's a reason why we can do this. And I'm going to run this through this fairly quickly. We kind of cover it in different ways. The E chain basically is sort of a reference to this, incorporates that kind of concept. All right, if I flip the late, I've done this before. Let's run it through it very quickly. It's the same concept. I flip out the lights in this room, nobody will be able to see anything. But once you start bringing up the lights, you start seeing contrast and everything else. Anything all blue. My favorite color. You can't see anything there, but still can't see anything there. Now you see that. Like when I was wearing Monday, I was making a note of that. I had two different shades of blue. Of course, I got a red and a blue. Something is apprehended. Something is understood in terms of what it isn't. We have in Western our whole Western outlook, we tend to see objects. We look at this, or we look at this as a disjunct, exclusive or, look at that, or we look at that, or anything else. We can't do that. For that very same reason, if I go back there and I have that field of blue, you're not going to be able to see anything. You have to see that blue in terms of what that blue is not. Either it's environment or something within it. That's how we apprehend things. We don't apprehend things by themselves. Which is kind of strange, something, a little process is going on, very subtle. We're not really aware of it. And I think it has to do with our neurophysiology. I don't know. But the way we look at things, we look at one thing or this or this. But with the dialectics, it's kind of like a process. And I, I don't have the words for it. You're kind of going back. and It's almost like going back and forth. God damn it, what's that? Uh, going back and forth between this and that, between this and that. And it's neither this, some medieval expression, neither this and nor, neither that. I, I, Russell can help me out with that somewhere. But it's somewhere, one of the uh, medieval scholars talked about it's neither this and nor, neither that. I don't know what the rest of it is, but it's something like that. And it's neither this nor that. But it, it's these together, one in terms of the other. And again, I don't have the words. I don't think we have that in our vocabulary. How we apprehend something. We ultimately refer to it kind of like, in a glancing way, dialectics. And I think that's what, the, the, what we're seeing this morning with that yin-yang stuff. There's a whole process. And this is what Whitehead was talking about in process-oriented apprehension. So I don't know if I'm getting closer with this, but that dialectics is, it, I call it a, the fundamental law. So we talk about interdisciplinary, intercultural, whatever it is, that's what's going on. I personally think we're belaboring the obvious. The more diversity, 
the more able to see things. That's a very common common sense thing from a statistical point of view. If I'm going to apprehend this, besides dialectics, I'm going to have to take as many samples as possible. So the more diversity, the more of these I get, the better I apprehend the whole. We do that in reading newspaper print. Our whole brains are structured this way, if you think about it. It's an inductive problem. Our rods and cones are points. And those rods and cones receive photons of light, and we get this illusion of solidity. So the more rods and cones we have, the more sampling, the more data points, whatever you want to call them, the better we have an idea of the whole. It's kind of like Plato's cave. You want to know what the reality is, we get samples of it. That's how you understand, it's, that's how you apprehend the whole. It's the same pattern, it's the same pattern of thinking. I see it basically as the same problem expressed in a variety of ways. So intercultural, interdisciplinary, that kind of stuff, to me, it's the same problem. It's obvious. Dialectics Q, you apprehend something in terms of what it isn't. That's, again, we cut it from the, the Far East. And we have it from Hegel, which basically is a rendition of this. That's all it is. Something in terms of what it is not. That's what they're saying. Again, it's a process. Something going on up here. And I, got it. I don't think we've got the verbiage for it. Now, we have, this is the basic basis of a system. As, long, as soon as you have something in terms of what it isn't, you have the most fundamental of fundamental of systems. That is the building block. And that's the end, looking at this origin and complexity, which I'll get into in a second. But that's where it starts. It starts with the dialectic. And correct me if I'm wrong. And you were saying in your book, that you have two ways, two views of system. There, there's a school saying that's inherent, which I think what your the position you're taking, and there's some people say that we impose it on the world. I think it's inherent, and I think it's inherent because of this, that dialectics. So something in terms of what it isn't is your most basic, basic system. Now, two types of systems, you get the static and you have the dynamic, and that gets into Ashby and something like that. So that's kind of like where we get. Then, then we start building on that. Once we get this, in terms of that, we have one of these. That's already a system because it's in terms of what it isn't. Now we can start relating them. See? Now, now, now we've got a whole bunch of them. Now we start getting complex systems. Now we have one of these, and we take that and we do the same thing over there. See? Now we get complex. This one related to that one. And those two right them, those that's set A, set B. Now we can start building. Now, I hate to say this, folks. But I think that is a binary basis. So a binary, in that sense, is, the, is really the foundation of, of all this. This is where, where Wheeler comes in, the it from bit. But there are problems with it. We'll get into that later. So we start off with basically the P and what it is and stuff like that. I don't want to spend too much time on it. This is how I, and this is all up there. You Google my name, blah, blah, it's all there. Because we, we have to race through this pretty quick because of time. But you'll see that there's a well-heeled way of doing this. And then ultimately what this happens in a binary system, you wind up with something like that. And then and there's 16 operating. This is a binary thing. Your computer buffs know, you can see, know about all this stuff. That's the base two system. Now we get a whole hypercube. We get a three-dimensional version. That's 4,996 of these things. That's, those are all the possibilities. That's called the three-dimensional hypercube. Published. All right, now, complexity. See, how, I didn't spend that much time on that, did I? He's afraid this, you know, this, this is a 50-slide presentation, so I had to run through these pretty quickly. So I want to get to the point. So what would happen? What happens from complexity? Describe the behavior of a system or model whose components interact in multiple ways and follow local rules. That is a definition of complexity. So it, they follow rules, like the simple system does. Same thing. All you're doing is just moving it up with more things. How complex is complex? I don't know. Again, it's definitional. And you set the boundaries, like in calculus, you set the boundaries, like everything else. You determine which slot the, the photon goes through. You see, it's the same problem over and again. You keep seeing that same object in the same room. Every time you open the door, there it is again. If that makes any sense. How do we get complexity? 
Well, I did this the other day with somebody. I had somebody take a piece of paper, the tore it in half, tore it in half, tore it, and they tore it in half, and they finally got down to plank scale. Well, not quite. They were in the, moving in the right direction. They didn't bring their uh, particle accelerator with them. So we get down to plank scale, and we get a rather interesting, this is, this, you can blame Descartes on this. And so we get down to plank scale. That's how we understand something, according to Descartes. So we get down to plank, plank scale. And you get down to this real weird area, and this is why we talk about Heisenberg uncertainty and stuff like that, because we get down into that, qu <coughs> that, that quantum level, things kind of, these so-called particles come in and out of existence. Hawking thinks they're going into another dimension, stuff that I read, and Lindy and his brain theory, you get a lot of quantum cosmological interesting things. But suffice it to say, you get down into that real soup level, something in terms of what it isn't. That is kind of a binary world. That's why, why Wheeler's coming from where he is. Piaget is saying sensibly that basically the predicate calculus doesn't have to be invented. It's already there, inherent. And I think it's inherent in this dialectic. We just don't have the words for it. And reductionism, that's we can't conceive anything until it's divisible. And you start dividing, blah, 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 and get down to that, and you get down into... Eddington's numbers and stuff like that. How many protons? See where I'm going with this thing. So what is complexity? Now let me give you a quick review on how you would get big data. That's his subject. I saw two things that in the last in several sessions here of how we generate big data. Now I'll give you an idea. There's a guy named Dr. Bruce Peeble, Peoples, who presented the other day. He's not here. He had the damnedest thing I've ever seen in my life. You he, he, take out your phone, and they, they got these programs, and that c camera up there can scan your eye. And that thing can pick up every damn movement of that eye, the eye, and translate whatever the hell it wants to translate. He presented a program. Give me a quick rendition of yours. You had something with this, this, this uh, language processing thing. This is damn, I've seen stuff like this, but you can go through a whole text, take anything in here, and this damn thing can analyze the text. You've got a bunch of these things out there. You can get down to complexity that is beyond your imagination. We have no clue about what complexity is until we start looking at stuff like this. Now, in big data, we have the volume, velocity, veracity and uh, uh, variability and we know in statistics the more variety you have the better you have an idea of the whole so this is this is kind of getting uh, I'm going to lead up to something here in a second context is the same nothing's in isolation that's a kind of quick review slide now what do we do with a system that's kind of like how Complex systems can evolve from all those. You can take, imagine what he's doing, or what Peoples is doing, and a bunch of other stuff, and you can just get an idea of where big data starts to originate. And I don't think we'd be, this is only the beginning. If you look at Eddington's number and stuff like that, and all the, you take a log, take the uh, Eddington's number as a log. Now we're getting complex. Now we take a system, what do you do with a system? You build a model. And you have any, it's a representation of the system. It's like Plato's cave. The system is the ideal. And Aristotle, the, 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 the shadow on the wall is a model, loosely. And then you go ahead and simulate it. I can't simulate a damn thing this way. Here we go. Now, so what we do at this point, quick review, we observe the phenomenon dialectically, establish a relationship, the minimum being two, and then we look at the relation type, apply it to a specific situation, instantiate the model, and that's what we do. But we're going to come to a little caveat. We're going to come to something that I had my friend down here, and he's uh, going to be talking about organic. Yeah, there's going to be life in the system. Now, this is where it starts to get creepy. Up to now, we can handle it. But I don't know if we can handle this from now on in. 
we're going to talk about these ensembles. Now this gets to be really weird, organic. We're talking about life, things having life of their own. Now there's a real concern when I was working at White Sands. I remember going, remember coming to a conference here. This was in 2007. And we have a lot of these systems out there that we, the War Department in the United States has, has something called net-centric warfare. Some of them have backed away from this. But there's a lot of concern bouncing around in various circles that a lot of these systems, what they're trying to do, they would take every piece out in the battlefield and anything in the military, I don't give it all the way down to bullets. And every one of those things would have an IP address. We were working on something called CRISC. It was Comprehensive Range Integrated Instrumentation System. And you take every damn thing you can identify going through the uh, GAO, GAO warehouse, you put a number on it. And ultimately what you do, they would call them participants. We were working on a small piece of this thing. And there were a lot of technical problems, but this is the idea that they had. So a lot of it's hubris. You put this whole damn thing together, and there's this Russian guy, I can't remember the damn name. Some, I got the book somewhere, it's called, it called Artificial War, put out in 2008. And what these buggers are doing is putting all the stuff together in this large automated system. It, it's almost like a robot, something you see in science fiction. You roll out the door, you fly, fly this thing over to some godforsaken country that kids can't locate on an outline map bomb the hell out of them, and it, it'll, it'll do your war for you. We're working on that. And with the idea, we, uh, it was a guy named La the University of Pennsylvania, La I can't remember his name, can't remember names with the damn, I can't even remember my own. And he was arguing that, and he were, had a real concern. There was some other reports I've been reading, with one that coming out, came out of uh, Virginia. It was a contract study. Again, I can't remember the name, but he, was, he wrote me back one email saying they don't really give a damn about interoperability, which they, a lot of them don't. And they don't give a damn about where the stuff is going. And these things, there's a real concern up there, and still is, that a lot of these things are assuming a life of their own. Well, how can you assume a life of your own if you don't talk about organicity? I'm scared to death of one of these things. I really am. They're, 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 they're enough, there's enough hubris up there. One of these things is going to crawl out of the damn closet one of these days. And it's going to go way the hell beyond our control. A guy named Peter Singer's written about this stuff like this. And we better start paying attention. We better start monitoring this stuff. And I've seen it, right? I've seen, I've seen it. And some of you guys in this room have seen it too. But what is life? And this gets into all this whole thing about consciousness and stuff like this. There's an organization I helped put together in 91 toward a science of consciousness. You can Google it out. We talk about life, consciousness, stuff like that. I still don't know what the hell it is. But we see something acting on its own. It does act on its own because it doesn't have to be uh, hydrocarbon based. It could be non-hydrocarbon based. Simon and Zeitko came out in 94 on scientific discovery. They claimed to develop, a, that's been 94. 20 years ago, developed a program which actually developed Galileo's laws independently. Things come a long way since then. Now we're getting into quantum computing and a few things like this. You go into his book right there and a couple of chapters on where that's going in supercomputers. So what is life? I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm alive. What is this thing? Organic system, and of course, that's Microsoft. Um, so some considerations. What is a system that can adapt? Does it adapt because it's hydrocarbon-based or not? I'm not sure. I don't think it makes any difference. They're adaptive systems. And then you get the more complex systems that seem to maintain themselves and change. This gets back into Ross Ashby and his design for brain. He talks about a homeostat, but he said that's not enough for a system. You have to have adaptability and stuff like this. Artificial systems evidently can behave as, as if, or maybe they are, organic. Now, I'm getting into the idea of what social is. How do you define social? 
social basically is a collection of individuals, blah, 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 blah. We can go on and on, all kinds of definitions, kick this around all day. The controversy or the discussion comes up starting, goes, goes way back to, I guess, Aristotle, as to whether or not a collection of individuals then in itself becomes organic, organic state. These are very popular ideas. Look at Spencer, for example. He talks about how a collection of individuals acts as one. There's a lot of stuff coming out now. I, I'm only peripherally familiar with it, like swarm theory and stuff like this. We have a seemingly disparate number of individuals kind of in a group acting in a unified way. Huh? Oh, shit, you're kidding. Sorry for the French, but I speak Spanish, too. All right. Anyway, the point is, degrees of social, go all that, it's in the, in the, it's not going to be in the video, this is, the guy's taping it. All right, what I am proposing is this. We have a system, put it together, we say that we may be organic. Now, we as academicians, I see then, if we're going to talk about our society as being an organism, a persona, we, in a sense, are its brain. What I'm arguing is that things have become so complex that they have really exceeded our ability to manage them in any way. Now, what's happening? I do want to get to these slides if I can find them. This is all it's in his book, too. Now, here's what I'm arguing. I go through saying, OK, what is the capability of the population to manage this stuff? I'm arguing that they cannot. 50% of all the US adults are illiterate. And on and on and on, you go through the NSF data and stuff like this. So we're talking about that population that can't even walk and chew gum at the same time. We get up at the, large, the higher leadership. I'm arguing that things have become so damn complex, even the leadership is not there. And if you don't think so, where's my damn phone? You can go into this morning's news and you see things breaking apart with five cops who shot in Dallas. This is, going, this is really spinning out of control, all this stuff. It's in there. I would argue that things have become so complex that the top leadership can't even deal with this. Now, I do want to get to this, if I can find it. This is, this is all kind of, everybody knows this. I think we're basically living in a big prison, and I think people, I think they are basically, things have gotten really out of control. We can't control these people. And because of the economics, the lack of education, the lack of direction, lack of affinity, on and on and on. There are thousands of reasons for this thing. But even the top leadership can't deal with this stuff. How do we manage it? We, we, we start to build a, an individual brain. That's hubris, maybe, but that's what's happening. So we start building these individual brains to solve problems like tools, OK? Now, th that's, that's, we find a tool to help, blah, blah, there's some, all right. Now, you guys need to look this up. This is your homework. You need to go in and look at the Utah da Data Center. It's something called the Domestic Surveillance Directorate. I am serious. It's a heart attack. I'll repeat, Domestic Surveillance Directorate. You go into this thing, and you talk about big data. You talk about that kind of stuff. He can, that his programs and programs like that, I'm not saying you're doing, but I'm saying that kind of thing not only generates big data, but you can get down into that editing number if you really push this thing far enough, and you can get big data that comes out of the big data. Okay? Now, these boogers are collecting this stuff on you, and if you don't think so, go to IARPA, I-A-R-P-A dot G-O-V. I urge everybody to go to that website and to poke around. That's what your government and our democratic society is doing to you. I want you to go to I-A-R-P-A dot G-O-V. That's the Intelligence uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency. I communicate with a guy named Vogelstein. He's out of my alma mater, Hopkins. Now, these dudes are working together along with Come on. That's how they got it wrong, hoping to get it right. But you also go to, here's another one, go to R, small o, research across domain criteria. Research across domain criteria. That is the National Institutes of Mental Health, and they're basically doing uh, neural mapping of human behavior along with genetics. They want to do basically a correlation of what go, the physical figure what goes on up here with human behavior, DSM, International Classification of Diseases, and stuff like this. 
I worked on a, a broad agency announcement, uh, BA BAA65. They are calling for people, and that contract was awarded. They're calling for people, basically, to preempt individuals. They want, to pe want some program, some method of going out there and examining people via via the neurophysiology or whatever it is to see if they are potential terrorist criminals and stuff like that. That was called for several years ago. BAA, this Broad Agency Announcement Dash 65, it's under Fiz, but Fed Biz Opportunities. So those three items you can do for homework and start figuring this out. You've got their domestic surveillance directorate, a la Gestapo, we got IARPA, and we got RODC, and all this stuff is big. So why in the hell are they doing all this? I'm not making this up. I didn't create this damn thing. You take one of these chips like that, and how many of these things can you fit to a building like that? How many, how many terabytes? I could put, what, two terabytes in this damn thing? That's right now. I could walk in and buy one for 500 bucks. Now, how many of these damn things can I put in a, in a building that size? Why? My contention is this. I think things have gotten so far the hell out of hand because of this stuff going on. There's some kind of a sense up there that, oh, my God, what do we do? This is hubris upon hubris that maybe they could develop a social brain. I think these people are so desperate. Not, I'm not trying to be conspiratorial, but you ask why. And I'm arguing that you've got to consider, maybe this is the kind of stuff going on, that somebody's got the idea they could develop this kind of a tool to kind of get him out of some of these messes, pure humors. But where do we as academicians come in? We are supposed to be the brains of the social organism. And I get back to those previous slides that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility of being aware of this kind of stuff, our philosophy. That's why I keep pounding on the table about ethos. You have some very great ideas. And I think you're kind of getting to the core of it. But you get to get down into this, like I did two years ago. That, that's what I did a couple years ago. You've got to start looking at yourselves, what our values about. I see all this stuff about entrepreneurship and business and crap like that. Not once have I really heard any series ad addressed to the ethos. Why? Are we trying to turn this country into a nation of peddlers? Or are we going to get something a little bit more humane than that? That we do have cooperation. If we don't cooperate, we're not going to make it. And we're not going to make it damn quick, starting in November. That's, 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 that's how soon it is. I, I, this is an alarm. It's an alarm bell. Yeah, I'm jumping up and down. And I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death about that Utah data. So I'm scared shitless. And you people should be too. I don't know where the hell this is going. I'm alarmed. And I talked to one dude yesterday. I can't remember her names. He was in the complexity theory. He really had it together. He looked at me. He was he's in the next conference. I'm not sure if he's here today. But he, 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 was, he told me face to face. He said in his complexity theory and all of his math, and God knows what the hell he had in his background, he looked at me calmly. He says, I don't think we're going to, I don't see how we're going to solve this. He's here at this conference. He's presented here. All I'm saying is that this is the kind of stuff we better start looking. We better look at ourselves. Are we going to be cooperative or on a, our business people? Are we going to be, uh, look at our ethos and start examining ourselves as an order? We have a responsibility. We may damn well start taking that responsibility as the brains of this whole society, because that's where we're at. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot more of this. This is, this is only, the, this is only a, a preview. That's where we can get it right. That's where we can get it right. We, we could have to reinvent ourselves. And I'm looking at, this is a very interesting little thing about Bostrom. Look at him up. He's rather, Bostrom is pretty in interesting. He thinks we're in a simulation. Is that very interesting? Or you take a look at Tipler. Tipler says in another uh, couple hundred thousand years, our organisms, organisms aren't going to be around. We're going to, everything's going to be on a chip, a la Kurzweil. Or super intelligence. And this guy named Glad, he says that we're already evolving. We're building our own evolution. That's where we're going with a lot of this stuff. Read the this, Those are interesting books. But that's, those are the steps. Once you understand all the tutorial stuff that I spent too much time on, you get into the ethos. And you better start becoming aware and start figuring out what the hell is this? Why is it there? Where is it coming from? 
Writing letters to your congressman is not going to do any good. This is already in place. They're doing it right now. And every time you look at that camera, I don't know when the hell those images are going. I really don't. And Frank, I, at my age of 71, I, I've got to a point, I'm not sure if I give a damn. But all I know is I'm going to keep working at this stuff, and maybe we'll, this will go somewhere. That's my sermon. Jeremy, thank you very much for your presentation. And, uh, you can keep that. Uh,